Hi, my name is Yes Now. My name is Chris Olson. My name is Nikki Tevely. Wait, I'm Sarah Lynn Harding. I guess all of our roles are all individual, but they also all connect with each other in many ways. When the Campus Cousins started, we were aiming more for an individualistic approach, it seemed like. We all seemed to have our own different um, events that we were going to hold and our own different pathways to take, but then we kind of all reconnected and have all been working on different events and, and um, gatherings together, so it's definitely more of a, a community approach now, and all of our events are definitely overlapping and interconnected, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the program is really individually driven, I think, by nature, especially considering we're in our, our pilot year. Um, so we each bring uh, different experiences, different backgrounds, different interests, and uh, the way that um, Matt has framed the Campus Cousins in uh, its inception year is to really just kind of um, allow us to take the reins, <laughs> which is really nice. And that uh, has really allowed us to incorporate um, a really diverse um, approach to programming. The key part we need to remember about this, this program is that we're here to be support for other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students on campus. And each of us are in a different area within our studies, and each of us are at different levels within our university studies. Um, for example, I just started my master's program in January, and so that's the Master of Arts, Natural Resources, and Environmental Studies program. So my goal is to try and establish and coordinate relationships from First Nations grad students to the Campus Cousins program, to the First Nations Center, and finding ways that I can be that bridge and that support for other grad students who are like myself. I mean, we're a very small group um, on campus and we live in a rural northern location. So that's one aspect that I bring to the program. And maybe each of us can talk about how we're incorporating what we're learning into our program, like what we're doing. I'm really um, passionate about the uh, retention of first year First Nations students. Um, I recently learned in one of my classes that the dropout rate for First Nations students is really high, especially after the first year. And being a First Nations student myself and looking back at my first year, I completely understand, like you, a lot of times these people are just moving away from their community and moving into like an individualistic society, and that's really hard. So creating a community on campus that involves First Nations people is really important and that's kind of what I'm striving for. Um, my studies are extremely interdisciplinary. <laughs> um, I'm doing a joint major in English and Environmental Studies with double minors in First Nations and International Studies. And I also sit as the um, Aboriginal representative for the Northern Undergraduate Student Society. So, um, I don't have as um, clearly, clearly delineated a path in front of me as I, I usually like to, but um, uh, having so many spinning plates at any given time is apparently how I function. So, um, my focus has been very much um, just on the community itself within the First Nation Center, which is probably the strongest now that it's been since I started here three years ago, this, mm -hmm. this will be my third year. And that's a really, really amazing thing to see. And especially considering that it is very uh, female driven, you know, as, as you can see, <laughs> you know, we have our, our, uh, our matriarchs that are really leading the pack, um, not just in terms of the Campus Cousins program or in terms of uh, First Nation student leadership on campus, but, um, it's, it's been kind of my uh, preference to really work on um, being a part of helping to develop community and to um, bring a, a different perspective to conversations that generally um, don't put as much weight behind the Aboriginal perspective as I feel like it should. And that is certainly something that has come up in a number of different ways. and. Um, it's, it's been a really amazing thing to be a part of. 
For me, um, I come from um, First Nation Studies and Psychology at the university. I've kind of pushed psychology aside because I felt that was not going to get me where I wanted to go. But um, in regard to um, the academy in general, I've been working a lot with indigenization and the decolonization of the academy through um, the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology here. But um, for Campus Cousins, I really focused on just the aspect of community building because, as we said, we're just in our pilot stages and an important part um, of the pilot stage of any project is building a community, especially in regard to what we're doing. So um, a lot of my studies have revolved around um, story revitalization, specifically Haida story revitalization. So what um, I've been working on with the help of everyone else is um, a Haida story revitalization storytelling session, which we've now decided is going to go through um, the International Studies Department, and we'll get some of the International Studies students in, and I'll tell them some Haida stories, and they'll tell me stories from um, their culture and their background as a step forward in community building with um, a, a larger group of people, more more of an outreach to different departments at UNBC, which is important. Building a community within the campus and um, really, like, if you go to the First Nation Center now, there aren't a lot of other people who um, interact with the center. So we are, like, I think our goal is to get more non-First Nations people more involved with the First Nations Center, with the First Nations students. Mm -hmm. We really try to focus on supporting First Nations students, both in the academic sense where possible, but also to allow them um, the opportunity to extend their reach outside of the little bubble that we all kind of place ourselves in when we first start out here. And I know personally it took probably the majority of my first year to actually to really um, begin to create connections even within the First Nations Center itself. You know, we, we have you know our, our ongoing jokes about pulling new people in and inviting them in and welcoming them in. And I think one of the most powerful resources that each of us have um, in our, you know, the, the numerous barriers and challenges that we experience throughout our academic journeys is one another. And, you know, the other dozen or 20 or so people to whom we know we can reach out if we're having a bad day or if we need advice on a class or how to deal with a professor or what resources are available to us. And I think that in recognition of the importance of that interconnectivity, that is something that we all endeavor to attempt to um, make accessible to other people. So um, that's something that has kind of been a, a cornerstone of uh, all of our various projects and interests and events is to uh, create avenues of access for people who don't inherently have that community or that support system behind them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that the core of your success at university depends on the quality of your relationships that you build within the university, um, within the different support centers that are available on every campus. And I know for me personally, I didn't actually start creating more relationships on campus until after the first year I had returned from study. So um, after 2015, I settled down a bit and I thought, okay, if I don't start reaching out to other people who are just hanging around the First Nations Center, I'm going to be very alone and very sad <laughs> for the rest of my, my undergrad. And it was the relationships that I opened myself up to that allowed me to have the confidence to complete my degree, to complete my bachelor's degree, without having made those friendships and those relationships and having people to bounce ideas off of. The university is very difficult, mm -hmm. and that's we all recognize that. We all want to be a part of a solution, and we all came together and said, we need to start making relationships um, and going out and putting ourselves out there to other students and to the faculty and saying, we're here, we're ready to work, we're ready to make things happen on campus. And that's, it's the, the core is the relationship that we can foster for students.
I mean, like anybody who's attending the university, mm -hmm. really. But like even outside of that, like I bring my kids to school sometimes, and mm -hmm. you know, we we support that as well. Like Sarah has uh, the powwow nights, and that's available for everybody of all mm -hmm. ages. So. Mm -hmm. I think there is a little bit of a focus on trying to um, make that first uh, initial reach to first year students, mm -hmm. but, and that's something that we're going to continue to expand on, is um, finding ways to create those connections immediately before they really get a chance to get overwhelmed or swept up in, mm -hmm. in you know, the, uh, the, the tide of, <laughs> of their studies, but all of our programming um, and events has been open to everybody, whether they be First Nation students, non-First Nation students, uh, faculty, other support staff, um, community members, families, as I said, children. Um, yeah, so we, we try to be as inclusive as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Well, we had goals. We had to do a social event, and we had to plan a major project. So I think that is right now is how we're, whether or not we get those done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have our weekly um, volunteer hours on campus. And, mm -hmm. and a weekly meeting where we come together and, and find ways that we can support each other in mm -hmm. our major projects, because sometimes... <coughs> It can be overwhelming, and I think the original idea was that it would be just our project, but that's just not how we operate. <laughs> if we see one person um, who might be having a really rough day, the yeah. others will swoop in and, and lift them up. Like it's, it's about holding each other up, mm -hmm. and I think one of our earliest discussions was we have to model that behavior. We have to model that holding others up for other students on campus because we are in student leadership positions mm -hmm. and we're putting ourselves out there so mm -hmm. one way to do, one way to lead is by example. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason each of us on our own decided to, um, to put ourselves in these positions and why we were selected to fulfill these positions is that we are all naturally, I think, um, positioned within our, our various uh, intersectionalities of community, uh, the fact that we're all always there <laughs> yeah, <laughs> makes always it really here. easy to be a, a really consistent, recognizable um, resource, not just to the, f the students who frequent the First Nation Center, but to anybody who just so happens to be walking by or recognizes us in, from classes. You know, I, I think it's probably pretty safe to say that it's happened to all of us at one point or another where we've had a classmate uh, or somebody who recognizes us through some way or another, hey, I have a question about this, or I'm looking for information on this. Who can I talk to? How can I get in touch with an elder? Uh, is Are these programs open to anybody? Can I just stop by the First Nation Center? And uh, I think being able to harness that and really direct it uh, to a program like this where we can begin to build up the program and uh, hopefully be a part of its continued success is definitely a huge part of it for, for all of us. Mm -hmm. We have a very small budget right now <laughs> and hopefully we're doing such amazing work that the university will give us more money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think when we're looking at this program, uh, especially in terms of measuring success, when your ultimate goal is to build community and you have people like like us and with you know the other students at the First Nation Center who seem to really focus on that community building um, just really naturally, it's a really difficult thing to measure any kind of success in that because it is simply a part of our cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, you we see people walking by, you pull them in, you invite them for a meal, you you know, um, so I think that we do have a really clear path towards succeeding our goals. Um, it's definitely a lot of work, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think that uh, we will be really proud to look back on this program in a couple of years mm -hmm. and see how much it has been allowed to grow because of the success that um, I, I don't doubt that it will find. I mean, Indigenous education is all about 
building relationships and relationality, and that's some, that's something that's a foundation. And what you learn in Indigenous studies, especially in my um, 300 course, which was Indigenous research methods, it's it's the foundation. And there's so many different authors and scholars out there who argue that's the foundation. What's the point of doing research? What's the point of having an education if you don't get to share it with someone? You don't get to share it with a community, a group of people, your people. So. Um, um, since it's built on foundations, that's exactly what we're doing as Indigenous peoples and through an Indigenous um, leadership program is building relationships, not with just the UMBC community like we already talked about, but with the community in general, anyone beyond the Prince George community. Even I have um, family and friends who come to visit from out of, out of town, out of the province, out of the country actually, who have come to UMBC and have attended events here because, I mean, I invited them to come, but it's still <laughs> something that is a prominent part of just a, a, a whole new level of relationship building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I think about um, you know Indigenous education, especially in, in the context um, of what we do and the different uh, pieces that we touch on, and what I think uh, is a lot to do with um, this research is looking at empowerment being such a huge part of Indigenous education and supporting uh, First Nation students um, who, who are getting their start here and who we all know are going to be able to contribute back to these to these conversations and to the development of uh, you know appropriate representation of, of indigenization in any number of fields. So um, yeah, I lost my thought, but Empowerment of, of Indigenous students, I think, is at the core of a lot of these discussions, mm -hmm. and uh, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. um, I think also sharing um, knowledge about First Nations people is important too, because it re reduces uh, discrimination and stereotypes, mm -hmm. and it's a part of the empowerment. It, it helps reduce shame felt by First Nations people. And I think mm -hmm. that's important too. Mm -hmm. Dispelling misconceptions. Yeah. yeah, I think what makes us stand apart as a group is that we are, we're self-led. You know, we're not, I'm sure the university would like to tell us how to do things, but <laughs> I don't know that we would listen because each and every one of us in the group, we are a leader. We are a student leader in our own right. But when we come together, there's that strength and that power that we that we share amongst each other. And that's something that, through Campus Cousins, we're able to give to other students. We're able to make space for other students on campus. And specifically for our First Nations, our Métis. And if we have any Inuit students, like, you know, the idea is that we're saving that space for them. Mm -hmm. And we're holding it for them until they're in that position where they can come in and maybe they're taking over for us or they're joining us and we get bigger. Um, but so much in academics is prescribed to you, especially at the undergraduate level, mm -hmm. and that's the difference I'm noticing between completing my bachelor's degree and, com and starting my master's is that in your undergrad, you, are, you don't have as much free reign as you want. You don't get to learn the things you necessarily are interested in until you get further along in your undergrad, like your third, fourth year. Um, whereas in a master's program, you have more freedom to just focus on your specific topics. And what we bring is that we can do whatever project we want, and that's freeing. It's empowering. I think it has to reflect our culture is that that is the natural way we learn, like um, not learning by sitting and listening to a professor, which is the standard, but learning through experience and um, through like a community-based type of learning, I think is the ideal for Indigenous education. And having our own cultures reflected in the work that we do. I mean, I'm just beginning to discover the world of indigenous research methodology. That's not something that was a part of my undergrad, but I can take the time and focus on that now mm -hmm. and understanding it. But indigenous education is also, to me, about 
reclaiming the way that our people conduct themselves and being a representative of that is an, it's an honor and it's a privilege and it's something that we must protect because as a Sikhwetan woman, as an educated Sikhwetan woman, I need to be able to reflect the way in which my people conduct themselves and the way we conduct ourselves is different from, from the Haida, from uh, the carrier and I mean, while we bear, we have commonality, like there's a common, you know, we respect the Mother Earth, we respect our elders, children are our number one priority because they're the hope for our future, but each of us will conduct our research in our own way, the same way that each of our communities are very unique, and Indigenous education needs to reflect that and be accepted at the post-secondary level. Mm -hmm. I think some of... Um, not some of, but a big part of um, Indigenous education, it in the totally lost my train of thought there. Um, indigenous education being so centered on Indigenous values that are, you know, by and large um, universal, not universal, but are very. Um, Based, no, no, why, why can't I talk today? <laughs> it's okay, they can it's early. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, value based approaches to Indigenous education, uh, in that it can be drawn upon by um, scholars, academics, students uh, from a number of different nations, is a huge part of why Indigenous education. Is, is such an important endeavor, not just for, for the academy, but for the um, entirety of I Indigenous peoples in Canada. I think that um, restructuring the way in which we approach Indigenous education and ensuring that the, the foundation of these changes are rooted in these value systems that are really uh, a core part of, of each one of us, despite coming from different nations with different practices, different cultures, um, for each of us having to participate in an educational uh, system that is not rooted in those values is where I think a lot of disconnection comes from, you know, uh, regardless of what program you're in or what the, the specificities of your um, your educational journey happen to be, the more we move towards this restructuring of Indigenous education, I think we will really start to see uh, the eventual removal of these barriers to um, Indigenous, not just success, but health and reconciliation, and um, having it really contribute to the development of Indigenous youth and their position, not just in their communities, but to the broader and national community as well, is uh, definitely a key part of, I think, why each of us have become involved in leadership. Well, for me, <clears throat> um, recently um, one of the uh, professors here, um, Adosti, or uh, Dr. Judith Thompson, We've been working on a paper and presentation called um, Decolonizing Our Colonized Minds, which revolves around the decolonization of our minds. But in recent literature, the words decolonization and indigenization and reconciliation sometimes have almost become, they've, they've been used interchangeably in so many senses. There seems to not be like a defined term or meaning for a lot of these, which is okay in many senses, but in order to achieve what we want to achieve, we thought perhaps we should add some definition, some clarity, because these words weren't created just to be used interchangeably. They have meanings behind them, specific meanings. So we presented, we also presented at the World Indigenous Peoples Conference in Education in Toronto this past July. And um, we basically, to sum it all up, a two-hour presentation, that decolonization 
um, revolves around land and land repatriation and learning from the land as indigenous peoples the way it's supposed to be, whereas indigenization revolves around incorporating indigenous pedagogies or ways of teaching and learning into westernized um, ways of knowing and education. So having those two um, defined terms, it seems easier to move forward and focus on different aspects of how to indigenize and how to decolonize in education. So obviously not for the full the next 10 years, but a prominent part for me, in my opinion, is being able to use those terms efficiently and know how to incorporate indigenous pedagogies into Western pedagogies versus decolonization, which revolves around learning from the land, which is an entirely new way of learning. And a lot of areas and a lot of uh, departments at UNBC have begun doing that. So for example, um, a First Nations Studies course that I did last um, summer with Nikki, we um, went to the Unistodon camp, which is um, a camp just outside of Houston, well, a ways outside of Houston, I guess, and it's a group of people, um, the Unistodon people, who are, um, they're reclaiming their land, they're taking back their land, they're taking back what's theirs, and they've occupied um, a part of their traditional territory, and they're, they're living off the land, they're learning from the land, they're teaching each other, they have their elders, they have their ways of knowing, and they're building a healing center, and they're healing from the traumatic effects of colonization through decolonization, learning and living on their land. So for me, that's a big part of the next few years of education is learning that there are more ways of learning and doing and teaching out there that go just beyond the academy and the Unistodon people are an example of that, and their success so far is an example of that. And it's something we should be striving to do as well within the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I would really, really hope to see in Indigenous education over the next uh, decade or so, and this may seem kind of silly, <laughs> but uh, Indigenous content being actually taught by Indigenous people would be really nice. I think I've had one uh, First Nations professor throughout the entirety of my First Nations uh, minor since I started here. Not to disparage uh, the non-Native professors who do teach Indigenous content because, you know, those that I've had have been wonderful people who are, you know, very passionate about uh, being allies and about appropriate representation and that's a wonderful thing to uh, have been able to experience but um, there, there is a definite disconnect uh, for, for us as First Nation students, as Indigenous academics to be engaging with Indigenous content being delivered by non-Indigenous um, professors and I think that it is um, definitely something that needs to be more firmly addressed um, and I, I'm sure each of us have had our run-ins with various professors who are coming from different backgrounds of either just not knowing or you know even dare I say blatant ignorance <laughs> on that one occasion or another but um, that I think is going to be very much key in um, the, the further development of Indigenous education is to ensure that the Indigenous voice is behind um, these endeavors. I think, um, I, I touched on this earlier, but I think that having um, Indigenous history taught even at the elementary or high school level um, is very important as well as, because it reduces the stigma and the shame and perhaps that way we can get more indigenous people applying and being su successful in post-secondary. Um, well my what I'd like to see my vision for the next 10 years I mean 10 years from now my youngest of five children will be 14 going on 15. And I want to know that when my daughter walks into her secondary school, the support staff will not pigeonhole her into an individual education plan that's unnecessary. Uh, I want to see that my daughter will be challenged academically, that she will be 
encouraged and supported to to take regular math, principles of math 12, that she'll be challenged and supported if she chooses to to pursue sciences. Mm -hmm. I want to know that those supports are in place and that she will be respected. Will that actually happen in the next 10 years? I'm not certain. But what I can say is that my son's experience, and he's my oldest child, he's 17, his experience in, in secondary school has been much different from mine. And even reflecting back to my own mother, who is a survivor of the residential school system in St. Joseph's Mission, um, her experience compared to my experience is much different. But what I want to see is my daughter being challenged and being supported. And I want to know that my grandchildren will have equal opportunity to to pursue their dreams without having to battle racism, without having to battle sexism and discrimination based on their skin or who their grandmother is. I don't want that life for my children. I know that we are capable if we continue working the way that we're working and holding up examples. It is possible and I hope it does happen. First thing that comes to my mind is elders, mm -hmm. First Nations elders, and their knowledge. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, each other, other First Nations students and First Nations people in general. Mm -hmm. Like even though, like I think it's it's wonderful, especially this group of campus cousins, because we all have different backgrounds and different ways of knowing, and we really help each other by bringing that all together. Mm. Yeah, and there's courses at UMBC, like the Una Stoughton course, mm -hmm. and I learned recently that this course might not be running again this summer because the cost to put on the course last summer was more than what they made for the course. So suddenly the institution in UNBC is all about making just money on the courses. Is that what we're about now? No. What we should be about is losing money in some areas because obviously money is being made in other areas substantially to put on these courses which revolve around such important pedagogies, especially the pedagogies I'm all about learning off the land and if we lose that course we lose more students with the possible future studying in the area that for example I want to, that we want to, learning off the land, things like that. So. Yes, that kind of involves funding in a sense, but not external funding, funding that should already be in place to run courses because that's what a university is supposed to do, is supposed to run courses. So things like that are very important not to eliminate. And just like Nikki said, elders as well. Elders were incorporated into that course without additional cost because there are indigenous elders, Unistotan elders, who live there full time and they have so much to share and so much that they want to teach us and eliminating that course is eliminating so many different important cultural and pedagogical aspects into our education. Mm -hmm. And I think too recognizing that indigenous education even if the focus is on post-secondary in the academy, understanding that this is not something that um, just kind of falls into your lap in your early to mid-twenties, that this focus in Indigenous education, even through the post-secondary lens, needs to start so much earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are looking at the success of language revitalization through Head Start programs or Language Nest programs, and encouraging our, our young people from, you know, from even that early age to aspire to, um, to aspire to lifelong learning in whatever context that may be. But when you look at communities that have entire graduating classes that are leaving high school with a leaving certificate opposed to a full dogwood, mm -hmm. and they're not either made aware of, of that difference or um, being told what impact having only a leaving certificate will have on their future. My former roommate graduated from high school thinking that she was, she was done, only to be told a year later that, oh no, you don't actually have a dog, would you have a leaving certificate? That put so many other barriers in front of her before she could even mm -hmm. hope to attend post-secondary. I myself was a ninth grade dropout, 
you know, and this is a very, very common story that we're seeing with Indigenous youth. And uh, I think that has a lot to do with why we have such low numbers represented, not just in post-secondary, but those who return to the educational field. You know, it's wonderful to see that we are having uh, a slightly higher number of um, Indigenous students who are wanting to get into the education program. Absolutely amazing. And I think that's definitely a really important step. But um, I think that in terms of resources, really putting uh, a mechanism in place to focus um, on that encouragement so much younger. And to, you know, like Sarah Lynn was talking about, um, not pigeonholing our students into just being passed through. And I think that is probably one of the most monumental barriers that we will encounter in Indigenous education, is uh, being able to positively influence change through this entire mechanism from K through 12. And um, really giving Indigenous students a platform through which they can find success and whatever success means to them. Not to say that, you know, uh, engaging in post-secondary is the only avenue, but when you are placing those barriers in front of them so early, you're not helping to ensure them success in any field.